If there's one thing I've learned over the last uh, couple of years, it's I'm pretty sure everything runs off a database. Like I'm almost positive now, everything runs off a database from the airline tickets I buy, to the fuel that you buy at a gas station, to grocery stores, to everything we do, there's a database somewhere that has a bunch of information. And the more you can standardize that information, the more valuable it is and the more you can do with it. So I know this because of what we do at Diesel Laptops. We standardize fault codes and put them in a database. We standardize labor times and put them in a database. Now you can look them up easy. You can apply them to your VIN number, create a VIN number. Our VIN lookup tool, it's a database of ones and zeros essentially at the end of the day uh, and letters and numbers, right? So everything's a database and VMRS is what this episode's about. It comes up in a lot of conversations. If you've ever worked with a big fleet and do anything with parts or labor, the word VMRS or the term has probably come up. So in this episode, we have Jack, who is literally the expert. There is no bigger expert on the face of the planet with VMRS than Jack. And he's gonna break it all down for us, what it is, why it's important, how it works, and what you use it for. So take a, take a good seat here, enjoy the episode, and I know you're gonna learn something for sure. Well, Jack Poster here, welcome to the show. And I know today we're gonna to talk about VMRS. And I think I found probably the most expert person I can possibly find on the planet when it comes to VMRS coding and VMRS I and what so. that is. <laughs> I hope so. Thanks so much for the invite too, Tyler. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is this is great. Like I, I don't I don't know if we've actually maybe we've met at a trade show or something. So this is what I love about the podcast. Mm -hmm. I get to talk to people yeah. and make introductions and I get to learn something through this whole process as well because VMRS is something I know a little bit about, but I'm using an acronym here that a lot of people might not even know what the heck it is. So why don't you just kind of explain VMRS to everyone at a high level, and then we'll, we'll dive into the details. Sure, it does stand for Vehicle Maintenance Reporting, which you'll notice I pause there with reporting standards. Uh, it was developed in 1970 by maintenance professionals they wanted a universal language. So VMRS over the years has become the universal language for maintenance, sort of like the musical notes. Uh, it's embedded in most software. And I can tell you most people that are using it don't even, they might not even realize it. But uh, that's basically, it's the main reason to use VMRS is for reporting. Over the years, people have used it for reporting more than anything else. And that's why I highlight reporting standards. And I work for the American Trucking Association, the Technology and Maintenance Council, and um, we've been in charge of it since then, and uh, it's been ongoing since then, and I've been there 17 years now, so I'm the guy in charge of it. Well, let's explain it a little bit more when it comes to parts, right? So I know there's different coding for different things, but let's focus on the parts for a little bit, because that's the one I'm most comfortable and familiar with. Sure, and, and that's what most people think of when they think of VMRS. Yeah, so basically what we're doing, what it does is creates like a categorizational system by components and subcomponents and major major components. Can you break down, I guess, like what a code looks like and, and what those different digits mean, I guess, when people look at a, a sure. particular code and a part number? Yeah, a VMRS, what most people know of is the component code, which is known as code key 33. It is comprised of nine digits. We took a nine-digit number and cut it into three pieces, the system, then the assembly, and then the full nine-digit is the component code. So, for example, 013 is brakes. doesn't matter what type of vehicle. It could be Freightliner Cascadia. It could be a Ford F-150. It could be a motorcycle. 013 are brakes. That's the high level. Then we took it and split it into different assemblies. So front brakes is 013001. Rear brake parts would be found in 013002. A couple other examples would be steering. All steering parts, 015. Tires, 017. After treatment, exhaust, 043. So when you add all nine digits together you get the component code now some users only go to the six digit they're only concerned let's say just front brakes they just want to know what would my front brakes cost spend you know what's the reliability 013001 that gives them that information 
if they want to pinpoint the component, they'll go to the nine digits, which the one I know by heart is 013-001-024, front brake, front brake drum, and so forth. So that is what most people think of when it comes to VMRS, that it's just a nine digit number, but it is much more than that. Yeah, all right, so I want to break this down more for the audience here. So. Basically, in this example that Jack just gave us here, 013-001-024 is a, is a front steer axle brake drum. Uh, sure. the, the question, uh, the, the point I want to make to people here, it doesn't matter what brand it is, right? It doesn't matter if it, or what part number it is, right? It could be a Gunite, it could be a Web, it could be a motor, it could be, it could be anyone's brand, and it could be any for any size axle, 12,000 pound steer axle or a 20,000 pound steer axle, doesn't, doesn't matter. We're still just talking about the brake drum. And if people that are doing maintenance on their vehicles, especially fleets, actually categorize their part numbers this way, and the same kind of methodology works for labor to a degree as well, I think mm -hmm. you were kind of hitting on here, but kind of the next question is like, well, what's the benefit of doing this? And I think what you were kind of alluding to here is like, well, now if I actually know every time I replace a front brake drum, I can start doing a little bit of analysis and a little bit of work to figure out what's going on with my drum. Can you, can you break it down a little bit? Like what, what do people actually do with this information once they code everything? Well, what makes it good is by using these universal numbers, instead of having to rely on a part number from the manufacturer, if you're in a, in a service operation and you wanna just know how much we spent on brakes, 013. You don't have to rely on five different part numbers that have been superseded over the years. If you want to dig deeper, 013001. It also allows you to spot trends. By pulling up these numbers, you can pretty quickly see what's going on in your on invoices, in the shop, and in inventory and warranties. So the benefits are we all know part number, it's part number roulette, I call it. Uh, you can buy the same brake drum, five different suppliers, you're going to have five different types of part numbers. Some are going to be hyphenated. Some are going to be capitalized. When you want to get a report, when you want to see your cost, reliability, having that one number makes life a lot easier because the computer reacts to an 013, 001, brings it right up. That makes life a lot easier. Yeah, it, it does. And I, I, I get it because we're trying to do the same thing for a lot of what we do. But I can see a big fleet. I own a bunch of trucks. I have all kinds of different makes and models, different years. And just to be able to ask the question, how much do I spend on brake drums a year? Or how much do I spend on uh, brake, pet, brake shoes a year? Those are hard questions to ask if you're buying different part numbers from different manufacturers through hundreds or thousands of invoices through a year. It's a really exactly. freaking tough question to ask. So unless there's a categorization system for that, um, it's almost impossible for a fleet to even know the answer to their own question. I know my exactly. company at Diesel Laptops a lot of times like, how many laptops do we sell this year? We're like, well, we sell them in bundles. Now we look at like 300 different SKU numbers and do a bunch of backhanded Excel yep. magic to try to figure this out. So having a standardization really makes a ton of sense when it comes down to this. Who are some of the customers that are really into this, that, that really do this well? Can you name any customers? Is this mainly for big fleets? Is it for little fleets? Like who, who utilizes this type of information? Well, the, the major fleets, use it and, and a lot of people ask me who is using it and I, I can't give you an exact number because if you're using fleet maintenance software chances are you're using VMRS but from fleets from Southeastern Freightline to Maverick to Ryder to Penske uh, JP Hunt uh, Trans Am they're all using it in one way or another some delve a little bit more into the weeds with it some are a little bit more you know into the numbers but most major fleets, and I, I've, I've spoken to smaller fleets, service providers are using it. It has moved into the uh, original equipment manufacturer world. The OEs are using it in one form or another. So it has expanded out in that regard. Another thing that I want to bring up that's important is invoicing. If you're in a shop, a service provider, a fleet, whatever, instead of having a technician type in it could be B-R-E-A-K or B-R-A-K-E. So by using these the BMRS codes that has the, the, the description in it, you don't have to rely on typing. Uh, you might have a technician that's a brilliant technician. He's not such a good typist. I'm not a good typist. 
So when you get these misspelled words, your data is completely corrupted because the computer doesn't realize break versus break. You know, so VMRS solves that by having that one way of describing a, a part, a component. Yeah, like, so just another story along that lines, uh, back in March of this year, I was at the Auto Care Association conference and they had a gentleman okay. up there talking about data standardization and why it's so important. And he brought up an example of a company he worked with and they did, um, they stocked the shelves for 7-Eleven stores. And he goes, okay, 7-Eleven, we see them all over the place, right? Like 7-11, he goes, that's how you think we would, they would have inputted these hundreds or thousands of visits into the into this system. Mm -hmm. And he goes, we looked, there was 136 different ways our users entered 7-Eleven into the, into no the system, oh. right? But it, it goes back to that same way. So when I was a service manager at a truck dealership, unless we use standard codes for like DOTs or services or clutch jobs, we couldn't even ask the question, well, what's our ROI on a clutch job or our average time it takes us to do that thing or the average, like we, we couldn't even do those simple questions and this is a big dealership org that's doing tens and tens of millions of dollars in service revenue as a service provider because it gets to be important at scale, especially because now you're like, okay, if we do so many clutch jobs, who is most effective at doing those clutch jobs? And let's put them on it so we have the most margin that we make and let's try to shop load and do things better. So I can really see how vendors get into the data on this side. And kind of going back to that conference I was at, it was a lot of it was about parts cataloging at the end of the day. A lot of these, the parts catalogs really be fine and really far behind on the heavy truck side compared to the automotive side. And one of the big fields, yeah, one of the big fields they always ask for is VMRS coding. So we've had a lot of parts manufacturers come to us and say, can you help us VMRS code our own part numbers because we don't, we don't understand this process or how it works or what we do. Have you had a lot of interaction with manufacturers of parts trying to get involved and trying to understand and, and go from that angle? Are, are those people involved in this too? Oh, sure. What will happen is a fleet will go to a parts manufacturer and say, um, we need some more information from you. Please provide us a VMRS code. And I inevitably get a call or an email from the president or the CEO or somebody, a VP, going, what is this VMS? What, what is this stuff? And it was never intended in that usage. For the, for the, in that world, but it has become that. Uh, and then a lot of them will take their inventory, match it to a VMRS code. And what I like to tell them is, well, they go, oh my God, we have so many different parts. I go, well, how many alternators do you sell? Different, oh my God, thousands. Well, there's only one code for an alternator. All your part numbers are wrapped into one alternator component code with VMRS. So once that manufacturer does that matching, they're pretty much done. So, it, it, but a lot of them are doing it because of the fleets their customers are asking for. So it's good business sense to do that. When your customers say we need something, it's a good idea to respond. So for the audience listening, if you've never heard of VMRS or you have heard of it, love to have you drop like a comment in there uh, and just tell us what you know about VMRS. If you've seen it in use, you haven't seen it in use where it's been applicable, or if you think it's a value. Love to hear comments at this point on what VMRS is, how it works for you, and what it's doing. Uh, another question that I know comes up is, obviously as technology changes, we have new things on vehicles all the time, right? Emission systems, the after treatment stuff, the SCR stuff, we got ADAS systems, now we got EVs, we got all kinds of new stuff going on. Who comes up with the new codes? How do you guys figure out, like, let's make a new code for a new, a new thing here? How does that process work? I'll give you the process. The other good one thing about that, Tyler, it's good for job security for me, <laughs> uh, because there's always something new. So, for example, let's go to the SCR system. Uh, prior to the government mandate, I worked with two of the OEMs. Uh, they work hand in hand with me. Um, they give me an inside look at what's coming. So we got together, put in the codes which they're in 043007, which is exhaust. And then there's a whole section on SCR parts. Uh, what I'm working on now, uh, which is probably the most difficult in all the years are the EV codes. Um, I've not really had to sign any NDAs until this has occurred because it's becoming such a proprietary way of doing business in the EV world. But we are slowly adding EV codes into uh, the database. So anything new from ADOS to lane department, anything is being put into VMRS. And another thing interesting is anybody, if 
if, if the part's not in there, we can add it in. I'm in charge of adding the new codes in with my boss, Robert Braswell. But I work with the people that are requesting the codes. So if a, co a request comes in from you, Tyler, you can request, we need two codes. A customer asks us for two new codes. I just need some information. Hopefully a PDF, a schematic, a good description. I will then put together a code or codes, send it back for you to give it the blessing. Once we agree, it goes into the system and that's, that's how it that's how it becomes part of the permanent VMRS database. So I've always felt that if the OEMs, the truck manufacturer guys and the engine guys really pushed their component suppliers, that there'd be kind of more adoption and be a, a lot of these component guys aren't VMRS coding stuff, right? Um, but they're not, I mean, they're being kind of asked by fleets, but I, I think if the OEMs ever actually started to push them, like the, the pack cars and the, the Navistars and Freightliner and all those guys, are you seeing those guys, are they involved at all much at the OEM level, the truck OEM or engine OEM level, or is it kind of a side thing for them or what's their involvement in this process? Well, they are some to a more of a, a more degree than others. Uh, they are asking their suppliers because when you think about it, the OEs don't make all their parts. I mean, they're buying parts just like anybody else. They've gone to their suppliers and asked for the VMRS code. Um, the main thing with that is anybody using VMRS, one word I st highly stress is audit. Audit what's going on because it's part of a data stream. You want to make sure that what you're receiving is correct. Uh, and double check. I'm not saying to fire people that are doing this, but just keep them aware of what's going on and double check what they're doing. But yeah, the OEs, the manufacturers, more and more are coming into the fold of adding VMRS into their systems. So let's talk about that for a second, right? Because I do see that occur occasionally where people have multiple, you know, you got multiple locations, multiple people trying to enter data. Obviously you're not just using parts that are on your shelf, you're using parts that you're buying from other parties, you have to add in your system and mm -hmm. add a VMRS code to them. So like for example, front bumper, uh, one person may say, hey, that's a frame mounted component. It should be on the frame. Uh, and they go look up the frame, you know, component go code and find something there. And then somebody else says, no, that's actually part of the hood or the front end of the truck. And they, they go to a different, now, now they've coded a bumper two different ways. How do you guys go about training organizations or is there a process they can go through to try to get everyone on the same page? Or what do you guys recommend they do to try to get consistency across the organization when they don't get that VMRS code from the people that are supplying those parts. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, that is a problem where you can be purchasing parts from three different entities all in the same day. When they arrive at your business, you're gonna see three different VMRS codes for the same part because a human being is attaching that code. Uh, we do offer, and it's free, we offer training with VMRS. With great, one good thing about the pandemic is with Teams and Zoom and everything else, we're offering free free training. Um, so that's the first step. The second step, I do recommend to anybody that's using VMRS, be it a fleet, a manufacturer, a service provider, it's always good to appoint someone, what I call them, the VMRS liaison. Um, it's like I would train the trainer. Have someone in your business know a little bit more, be the go-to person, get to know me, I get to know them, and we can work hand in hand. And once again, audit the, uh, the, uh, the information. I do auditing for some companies where they'll send me 25 different codes and say, hey, can you take a look at these? I don't need to know the pricing, black that out. I don't even know where you're buying it from. But it's good, no matter how long you've been using VMRS, it's always good to brush up on it at least once a year. Uh, we train our techs constantly. It's a good idea to train on, on, on VMRS. Another thing, even if you're a technician, uh, you might not be a technician all your life. You might move up to a VP and service director where you are going to run into VMRS. So instead of hitting a brick wall when you get to it, if you learn a little bit about it and know some about it before that, you're pretty much set to move up the ladder if that's what you want to do. But we do offer free training. It's a simple matter of getting a hold of me. We offer materials, uh, books, you name it. We can try to help you out in any way we can. 
So you'd mentioned earlier that the electrification stuff was a little more complicated or difficult than, than you anticipated. Can you expand on that a little bit? I'm just curious why, I guess, why that one's a little more complicated. Well, when, than when I started on the project, I had nice brown hair. Now look at me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's, it's a whole new world, Tyler. I mean, I, uh, I wish I was a younger guy that I could see what this comes to fruition. Um, when I get the, for years, the parts, the component requests for something. Okay, I know this. This is easy to grasp. But this is the first time that I've looked at the components and I'm going, what is this? And then when I see the diagrams and the schematics, I'm going, oh my goodness. So, but what's neat is, and um, our offices are in Washington, D.C. I, I work from home, I'm in Pennsylvania. But unlike our Congress, we work with, and it's a very democratic process with VMRM. I'll work with anybody, uh, the OEs, the manufacturers, fleets, to put the codes in. So I don't arbitrarily just put codes in. I want to work with people that are the experts. Uh, another area we're starting to move into is recycling and waste. Uh, a lot of waste companies and recycling companies have specific equipment needs and parts. So we're adding that in. And, um, you know, that is a lot of different parts coming into that. So whoever's out there that wants to add codes in, it's just a matter of working with us and giving us some information. Well, if you have to look down the future, uh, you've been doing this for a while. I, I gotta imagine you got a you got a protege or someone coming in eventually behind you here. But where what challenges yeah. or where do you see the future of VMRS coding going to if you look down the road the next five ten years? Well, the future is, and it's like anybody else, it's going to be AI. I mean, I might be replaced someday by just a, a laptop. You know, I don't know. Uh, but there still has to be some personal interaction. Uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting ride with the EVs and what technology might come after that. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult keeping, keeping up, I'll be very honest with you. Um, things are changing. The other thing with EV that go back to that is a lot of the companies are proprietary. And, and the other thing that some of them are startups that I talked to a year or two ago and they're no longer around, which is something I'm seeing a little bit more and more of where they get into the EV world thinking they're gonna make a big splash and then they nothing comes about with it. But uh, I think EVs are gonna be a big thing, whatever after that. And if AI comes into this world too, it might it might affect this also, I don't know. So, yeah. But we try to keep up. You know. Yeah, you're right. You know, go back to your other comment. You're absolutely right. I remember going to Navistar's e-mobility sensor and they're showing us all the components. I'm like, what the heck are all these things? And <laughs> what what are they doing here? Why is there coolant lines running everywhere and all these things? I was like, okay, this is not what I thought it was going to be when I first got up there. So I, I understand the complexity thing. And yeah, the world's changing fast. Even over here, we're starting to do some AI stuff and trying to make things easier sure. for people. A lot of a lot of shortcuts, a lot of tools. Uh, Jack, if someone wants to get a hold of you or learn more about VMRS, they're interested in bringing it into their organization or just learning more, where where should they go? Yeah, I, I, and I encourage this. Please, there's and one thing, there's no such thing as a dumb question when it comes to VMRS. I don't care how long you've been using it, ask it. So you can get a hold of me at jposter, J-P-O-S-T-E-R, at trucking.org. Uh, my phone number to my office is 703-838-7928. Uh, come to a TMC meeting. I'm, I'm, we'll be there in November, in uh, March, excuse me, in New Orleans. And we're going to have one in the fall in Raleigh, Supertech. Uh, feel free to interact. Please contact me. If I don't hear from the users, I'm assuming everything's fine. And you know what assuming does. So uh, I like to hear from the users. That's the only way we can make it better is hearing feedback from the users out there. So please get in touch. Well, it's, it's, it's important. Jack, thank you very much for coming on. And just for the audience too, uh, if you've never been involved in TMC and you're in this industry at all, that is the one place to go to where you see collaboration among competitors, fleets are there. It is just, it, it's, yeah, there's an expo going on, but there are so many uh, different groups going on and sessions going on where people are collaborating and trying to figure out things and just make our world a little bit better place. So all those behind the theme, scene things, the recommended practices, the standards, uh, we're talking about one here today with VMRS. There's plenty of other standards out there like J1939 and all these electronic things. Mm -hmm. It's all coming 
from TMC. So it's a great organization. We've been a member of it since day one here at Diesel Laptops. I will for sure be in New Orleans in March because first of all, I love New Orleans and it's TMC. So hopefully Jack will get a chance to meet you there, grab you a drink at the bar or something. I look forward to it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on. We're going to end the episode as we always do. It's not just diagnostics done right. You got to also have some standards. You got to know what you're working on, how much money you're spending, where it's going. That's how you be effective at your job. That's how you make your company more money. That's how you just try to get through everything. So thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Like, comment, subscribe, share. We'll see you on the next episode.